Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Uh, the Buddha is the teacher. We are his disciples. The Buddha knows. We do not know. Mm. Welcome all today to a short recording, a guided meditation and a talk. So I'd just like to start the day with uh, just calming down. So just to make sure you're in a comfortable position. When you're in a comfortable position, it's easy for the mind to relax. You can you know, sometimes just rubbing the shoulders or moving into a slightly more comfortable position is useful. And just start by centering the mind. And we have a tendency to be coming and going. And so part of learning to meditate is learning to put down the actions of doing. The tendency to always feel like we need to do something and just to enjoy peace and, and simple things. The, the world is always wanting to run here and run there, and when we learn to meditate and follow the Buddhist path, it's going against the grain of the world. So amongst the agitated, we can be free from agitation. Amongst the busyness, we can be free from being busy. Amongst the restless, we can be calm. <sighs> so just start by tuning into the breath, tuning into peace. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. Just enjoying, letting go of everything. Become aware of sights, sounds, smells, taste, touch, and thought. Don't give up liking and disliking. Just have a heart of contentment, accepting whatever is arising. When we have a peaceful mind, then we can attend wisely. Peaceful heart. A bright heart. A luminous heart. So in Buddhism, we have this term called sankara. And um, if a dhamma is like a thought or a nature, it's like a forest, or a sankara would just be like a single tree of that forest. So it's just like the tendency towards action. It's the, uh, or, uh, you know, a single volition or intention. And so the universe, physical and immaterial, the ambrosial, is really made up as a combination of sankhara. And the mind being the forerunner of all things, sankhara can mean all phenomena, physical and immaterial. And it's also one of the components of the mind. We have uh, in Buddhism, a being is made up of five khandhas, five groups. First being form, and form can be known as the four elements. And then the second is feeling. The third is perception. 
The fourth is Sankara, and the fifth is consciousness. And Sankara is actually uh, what an arahant is I would have equanimity to. So a being who becomes enlightened first becomes like a king or a queen of their own lives in that they perfect goodness of their heart and to the highest level. And then rather than seeking rebirth in a heavenly realm, one then uses that good of virtue, the good of the wisdom of the Buddhist path, to then come back at that highest point and then develop equanimity to all sankhara and be able to put things down. And that final equanimity to sankhara is what arahants experience as the last step. And so equanimity is also the fourth of the Brahma Viharas. And so the Brahma Viharas are the qualities that you find in Devas, Devatas, Brahmas. These are excellent qualities of heart. And they're independent of, they're not just arising in Buddhism, these are natural states that can be cultivated by any being of any religion or walk of life. The first is benevolence, the second, compassion, the third, appreciative joy, and the fourth, equanimity. And so to truly understand equanimity, one can cultivate first the other three Brahmaviharas, or one of them, and then based upon that Brahmavihara, one can then understand more what equanimity actually is, that it's coming from a very happy, joyful place and then coming back to equanimity and peace. And so when we see agitation and problems in the world, it's just another opportunity for us to brighten our own hearts and to live in peace. And that similarly, if, if a mountain was crushing everything in its path, coming in all directions, the Buddha's teaching is still to do good and make merit, to make use of the time we have. If we were to die in one hour, how could we make use best of this next hour? Should we complain about the world around us, the difficulties in front of us, or should we have a bright heart and come from a good place? And so, of course, the latter is the way that the Buddha recommends. There's actually four ways of practice, though. And um, like the uh, difficult and slow path, the difficult and path, fast path, the happy and slow path, and the happy and fast path. Uh, the wording might not be perfect, but the Buddha only recommended the fourth of those paths. So whenever we're suffering, it just means that we haven't yet found the right means of practice to practice the more, the easy and the quick way. And so the Brahma Viharas, the Buddha throughout the teachings that come down to us, recommends the Brahma Viharas as a foundation for the heart. And so, you know, there's a few ways that one can do it, starting with oneself, and then, you know, the tree one sitting under, the little beings there, and then greater and greater. Or you can focus on uh, like one town and then one province, and greater and greater. Or you can start with one direction. And uh, I would recommend even just for 15 minutes a day people to try and develop uh, these brahma for they're really, uh, the reason they're called brahma is it's the Wahara, it's the dwelling place of the Brahmas. So these are qualities that truly make the heart excellent. And 
And when you have these good qualities, then you can bring them back to the simpleness of developing the breath in the present moment. And, uh, and also it's a way of removing thorns. There's a tendency in this world, in all worlds, all times, to look at the negative things in people around us. But with the Brahma Waharas teach us to have that same goodness to all beings, regardless of who they are or what they've done. And, and so it's quite liberating in the sense that uh, it's just tuning in to a good thought towards all beings, regardless of what they've done or who they are. And so it's a way of chipping away, like if a person has anger or irritation, then try and regularly develop benevolence. And, you know, if somebody is a little bit cruel or, you know, has difficult thoughts towards people, then regularly try and develop compassion. And if, if one is ever a bit depressed or a bit down, and regularly develop appreciative joy. And so by learning how our mind flows into negative ways, then we can counteract that by developing uh, the first three of the Brahmaharas. But I would suggest really trying to perfect one of the first three of the Brahmaharas before developing equanimity. But equanimity is quite interesting. The way that it's described in the teachings is like covering things with white cloth. So if you, if you think of all the people you know, all the possessions you can think of, everything in the world, and you just cover everything with white sheets, then there may be differentiation, but everything is white. So there's no longer any problems. And this is very hard for people who are caught up in the difficulties of the world to understand. But if you come from a bright and good heart, and then you're able to put everything down, and, and then you see, you know, you, sometimes the world may be really excellent and there's great leaders, and sometimes the world may be difficult and there's suffering and hardship. But through the perfection of our meditation and the perfection of the Brahma Viharas, then we're able to use that goodness to put things down and to dwell in peace and learn to be aloof and seek out solitude and, and really enjoy cultivating the values and, and the goals that the Buddha has given us. And then, and we see it's like, I think it was uh, Venerable Kachana, and he had the simile of the Buddha is like the roots and the trunk and then the disciples are like the branches and the leaves. And the idea is that whatever we do, if we can come back to reflecting on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and the training, because everything's actually coming out of the Buddha. Nothing is independent from the Buddha. And that's what makes Buddhas excellent beings, is they've practiced for the welfare of the many. And then out of their teachings arises our practice. And, and so we don't have to perfect ourselves to the level that a Buddha perfected it themselves through countless aeons, but we can use the teachings that the Buddha has left us to come through understanding cause and effect. We can learn what things lead towards fires in the hearts and difficulty, and, and what things extinguish those fires and lead towards peace. And this is the best place that I've seen this is in Majjhima the middle length death course is number eight, uh, known as the Sileka Sutta. And it outlines there that the jhanas, which can be based on the four Brahma Viharas or just the cultivation of a single meditation object over very long periods of time, until the mind unifies, that they are pleasant abidings but the Buddha specifically outlines what Nibbana, the path to Nibbana is, the path to extinguishment of suffering. 
and it's the 44 Sulaika. So in that sutta outlines 44 qualities that can be overcome step by step. So we use our meditation, we use our generosity, we use the Brahma Viharas to extinguish the difficulties in our own heart. We don't look at the world around us or people around us to see difficulties in other people, but we look right here in our own heart, in our own mind. And so that's the little teaching I have for you today. And I will just do a little guided meditation. So um, <clears throat> once again, I once found a teaching where the Buddha said, relax the body, relax the eyes, and don't flow after the asuas, which are like the outflowings of the mind. So to begin with, if we just start by getting into a comfortable position, meditate for about 10 minutes or so. And just tune, tune into peace. Tune into the simple joy of being present. The past is just thoughts, let it go. The future is just imagination, let it go. The present is just sights, sounds, smells, taste, touch, and arising mental objects. That's all. So come into the present. Relax the toes and feet. Relax the lower legs and knees. Relax the thighs and the hip bones. Relax the lower spine and the belly. And just become aware of the belly as it rises and falls on, on its own. Aware of the belly from the inside out. Relaxing deeper and deeper the movement of the belly and the diaphragm. Content with things as they are. Not demanding in nature. With a respectful heart, respecting the elders in our community, the elders in the Buddhist community, the wise people of the Four Quarters. Relaxing the belly deeper and deeper. Letting go of all tension, all worry. A willingness to accept life and death, whatever may come. Content just to be here. Relaxing the belly deeper and deeper. Relinquishing the eight worldly winds, the worries of the mind, restlessness. Relax the chest and heart. Deeply relax the heart. And as if metaphorically, the chains and shackles of the heart get unlocked, untied, undone. And the heart begins to let go of all of its difficulties starts to become bright and luminous. We commit to the precepts that we're undertaking. Commit to training in virtue as the foundation for the heart. In generosity, in bhavana, cultivation of mind, in peace, 
in seclusion. As the heart begins to brighten, bring up benevolence to ourselves and all beings, compassion to ourselves and all beings, and appreciative joy. Appreciative joy to all beings in the ambrosia with a happy and equanimous heart. May all beings make good of the goodness in their hearts. Enjoy that goodness. Make much of it. And like a plane going above the clouds, it's like we lift above all the difficulties and our heart begins to be set free from difficulty, luminous and bright. Relax the middle back and sides, the upper back and sides, and the shoulders. Letting go of all tension and difficulties in the shoulders. Whatever the posture the body likes to be in, to feel upright and engaged in the meditation, but also relaxed and at peace. Let all tension in the shoulders unwind. Deeper and deeper relaxed. Like the shimmer of light across the ocean, all tension vanishing in the shoulders. Relax the upper arms, elbows, lower arms, the wrists and the hands. and make any final adjustments to the body. As the hands relax deeper and deeper, allow all tension from the shoulders to the fingertips to drain out into the earth. <clears throat> Do the hands completely at ease. Like soft clouds or cotton wool, soft, peaceful at ease. And from the shoulders to the tips of the toes, like soft clouds or cotton wool, peaceful and at ease. The whole nervous system tuning into tranquility, tuning into peace. Relax the neck and throat, relax the jaw, the chin, the cheeks and cheekbones. Relax the lips and the tongue down to the root. Relax above the lips, the upper cheeks, the nostrils, the nose. Relax around the eyes and the bags of the eyes. Relax the eyelids and the eyes themselves. Completely at peace, luminous and at ease, all tension breaking into emptiness, all that remains is eyes of wisdom, eyes of peace. Relax the eyebrows. and the lines of the forehead. 
the furrows of worry. Every time we worry, it's furrows of worry on the forehead. Just imagine the forehead completely at peace, all tension fading away. Smooth and at ease. And likewise to all the micro muscles of the face, the head, the whole body. Any lingering tension, it's just feelings of dukkha, just bringing equanimity and peace and tranquility to any remaining feelings of dukkha. Cover them with white sheets, accept them as they are, allow the body to vanish, to fade into peace fade into joy. Any lingering feelings to cover with white sheets of equanimity, allowing restlessness to settle into peace, agitation into comfort. Thinking into ease, coolness, the shade of goodness. It's like we've been crossing a desert and we've come to an oasis, sitting in the coolness of the trees. We have a taste of the coolness of Nibbana. And to welcome presence rather than mindfulness, fullness of mind, fullness of presence being right here with the wholeness of our heart, completely awake, joyfully present, content with anything that arises, content with ourselves as we are right now and our commitments and our determinations, welcoming the present moment. Welcoming just one breath coming in. Being present to just one breath going out. It's joyful just to be with one in breath. Joyful just to be with one out breath. respectful and a humble heart. Joyful just to be with one in breath. Joyful just to be with one out breath. Completely alive, completely awake completely present.
joyful just to be with one in breath. Joyful just to be with one out breath. Luminous heart, the heart of boundless benevolence, boundless compassion, boundless joy, joyful just to be with one in breath, joyful just to be with one out breath. Any other contact that arises, just cover with the white sheets of equanimity and come back to the present, to a single in-breath or a single out-breath, totally present, the welcoming and respectful heart. Joyful just to be with one in breath. Joyful just to be with one out breath. Completely with the fullness of Anna in breath, opana, out breath. Joyful just to be with one in breath. Joyful just to be with one out breath. a radiant heart, a welcoming heart. Aware of the flow of the breath coming in. Aware of the flow of the breath going out. Relinquishing all tendencies to do. Just cultivating the, the desire to be with one in breath and one out breath. Selective in our action. Relinquishing proliferation. Joyful to be with one in breath. Joyful to be with one out breath.
speaking and meditating for about half an hour now. So just come to awareness. What is sati? Sati is presence of mind, being present, how we attend. And in Buddhism there's four focuses. So mainly we've been aware of the breath body, aware of the feelings of the breath, and aware of the concept of joy and presence. So we just see how was sati nurtured so that we can become skillful. Was it relaxing the body? Was it relinquishing the past and the future? Was it the Brahma Viharas or opening the heart? Now is the time to inquire how was sati nurtured? What was the skillful means that worked? We use the peace to learn how we practiced that was of benefit so we can become like a skilled carpenter working on a lathe. We know how to be with the breath, how to be present. So was there any particular means that was useful? myself, I liked the rising above the clouds to see the luminosity of the heart and set the mind for the meditation. So now let us share benevolence with ourselves, with those around us, with those we know, with all beings everywhere and share boundless compassion with ourselves, with those around us, with those we know, and all beings everywhere. And appreciative joy, we share with great Brahma and the Brahmas, with the great Saka, the gods of 33, and all the Devatas, formless beings, pure abode beings, all humans, all arahants, all sangha, those who are poor and sick, those who are angry, those who are wise, and with all other realms, all beings and the emperors, you including ourselves, boundless appreciative joy, and likewise boundless equanimity, with a heart of peace and coolness, aloof, covering everything in existence with white sheets. We share this with ourselves, and we share this with all beings everywhere. May all beings develop a heart of the four Brahma Viharas. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May all beings be well. <laughs>